No problem at all. Thanks again. And uh, okay, uh, is Zlater Simek uh, here? I think we can. Uh, Zlater, Zlater. Yes. Are you here? Hello. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay. Am I good to begin? Please. So Zlater okay. is gonna talk. Mm. So, divine hideness and mutually reciprocal love, please. Great. Thank you so, so much. Um, well, good afternoon or evening or morning, uh, wherever you find yourself today. Thanks so much. And for afternoon here. Time. Oh, afternoon. Well, hello. Um, thanks for coming to my talk today. I genuinely really appreciate um, you making the time. And I just want to begin by thanking the conference organizers at Unisinos. Uh, for putting together a really terrific conference. Um, since there are um, time constraints, I'm just going to dive right in. So looking at the family of problems known as divine hiddenness, um, whether one prefers the doxastic iterations or the experiential iterations, what seems to be absolutely central to the problems of hiddenness is violated expectations, particularly in regards to God's love. When divine hiddenness presents in a way that is deemed incompatible with divine love, one's expectations for what divine love should be like are violated and subsequently um, results in a problem of divine hiddenness. So the focus of this talk will be more at a meta level, uh, seeking to address what I take to be an underlying issue that is central to the various iterations of divine hiddenness. And the way I hope to address this problem of violated expectations is by arguing for a recalibration of our expectations. Specifically, that contrary to the belief that hiddenness in some ways undermines God's love, I want to argue that actually hiddenness is part and parcel with God's love. My argument goes something like this. There's good reason to think God exists, he is perfectly loving, and he desires a relationship of mutually reciprocal love, what I will call RMRL for short. Um, if he desires this sort of relationship with humans, then he will necessarily remain at least partially hidden, at least this side of heaven. This is because a full revelation of a perfectly loving, perfect being would be so compelling as to be irresistible, so much so that it would effectively eliminate human freedom. However, inasmuch as a RMRL between God and humans requires humans having libertarian freedom to either reciprocate or reject God's love, God will at least partially hide himself in order to protect the freedom necessary for this relationship to obtain. So that's quite a bit to throw at you right at the beginning, but that's the overview of the direction I'll be taking here. So in regards to God desiring a relationship of mutually reciprocal love, if it is the case that God is a perfectly loving person, open to personal relationship, as J.L. Schellenberg has famously articulated, then it seems pretty intuitive to me at least to think that the sort of relationship this God would be open to is one of love, specifically mutually reciprocal love. Now, in order for this sort of relationship to obtain, certain conditions need to be in place. Specifically, the libertarian freedom to either reject or reciprocate God's love. In agreement with Aquinas in the divine human relationship, in order for love to actually be so, humans must possess the capacity to resist God's love. And if humans must possess the capacity to resist God's love, surely it must also be the case that they possess the capacity to reciprocate God's love. So in short, in order for love to be love, at least between humans and God, humans need freedom with alternative possibilities either reject or reciprocate God's love. And I think Aquinas' argument tracks well with common intuitions about the nature of love between humans and God. There seems to be something fundamentally awry about the notion of God pre-programming us to love him. In fact, absent of our having any choice in the matter, it's hard to grasp how love could in fact be so. So the antecedent condition for a RMRL to obtain between God and humans is libertarian freedom at least in regards to the divine human relationship. So having established the need for libertarian freedom, it obviously remains to be seen how a full revelation of God would eliminate persons' libertarian freedom to respond to him. So before going any further into my argument, it is necessary to first establish that empirically, it just is the case that purported divine self-revelation exerts some influence on our freedom. As Helen de Cruz has already done some really great work in this area, I won't endeavor to reinvent the wheel. So I'll just use one study to support my point. But if you'd like to see more data, I point you to her amazing paper or others within the cognitive science of religion more broadly. So in a study conducted by Azim Sharif 
and Era Noren Zion, which sought to examine whether making God more salient would lead participants to being more altruistic, participants were given $10, which they could choose to split whichever way they'd like between themselves and another participant. Now, there were two groups in the study, and each group would listen to a randomized series of words before choosing to scoop money. One group was, of course, the control group, and the other group was the experimental group, who were primed with religious words um, like spirit and divine, quite generic religious words. The outcome of the study, however, I think is quite telling. Those who were religiously primed donated an average of $4.22, which amounted to a 129% higher amount given compared to those who are in the control group who donated an average of 184. So as it relates to the argument in my paper, this study lays the foundation for establishing that an increased salience of God seems to affect person's freedom. Now, to be clear, at this juncture, I'm arguing that increased salience of God eliminates freedom, just that according to cognitive science of religion, it does seem to at least influence it. So to extrapolate a bit from the study, if the data suggests that the mere mention of religious language exerts an influence on one's freedom, what might we expect from stronger religious crimes? Say some sort of iconography, well, pardon me, or a priest, or, or even stronger, assuming such things were manipulatable, a miracle, or even stronger, an angel or a demon, or even stronger, hearing God's voice or seeking a partial uh, revelation of God. Now, I don't ask these questions rhetorically. It seems pretty reasonable to think that as clarity and intensity of religious crimes increases, so too would the influence of person's freedom. Now, imagine instead that in this imagined study, that God just fully chose to show up, whatever that entails, not at all hidden. What sort of effect could we reasonably expect that to have on participants' freedom? If it is the case that as clarity and intensity of religious crimes increases, so too does influence, then were God to fully reveal himself, could participants continue to act freely? I want to argue no. Why should we think that is the case? So on one hand, we've got the empirical support, and the other, which I'll be turning to now, is what it is actually like to experience love. I take it as a fairly uncontroversial assertion to say that it is easier to want to return love to those who love us as compared to those who do not. Uh, as such, it seems also rather intuitive to think that the more pleasing the love one receives, the more likely the recipient will, recipient will reciprocate love, in as much, at least, as they're aware of their being the recipient of love. And if one receives love, they are guaranteed to reciprocate asserting that as the quality of love received increases, so too does the likelihood of reciprocation. Thus, the closer one gets to demonstrating perfect love, whatever that may entail, the more likely the recipient of said love will reciprocate. Let us imagine, then, a hypothetical relationship between Romeo and Juliet. Romeo is extremely interested in a romantic relationship with Juliet, and in the hopes of wooing Juliet, Romeo per at the logic of what has been said so far, what sort of response could we expect from Juliet as the recipient of perfect love from Romeo? Juliet is, of course, free to respond how she likes, but what reason could she have for not responding with reciprocated love towards Romeo? Well, it seems, at least to me, a bit counterintuitive to think that were Juliet the recipient of perfect love, she would not reciprocate. I'm happy to grant that she would retain her libertarian freedom. Now, I'm happy to grant this as the relationship that is the focus of this essay is one of mutually reciprocal love between God and human persons, which means it's not simply humans being the recipients of perfect love, but being the recipients of perfect love from a perfect person. So imagine now that you are the recipient of perfect love from a perfect person. This person is so perfect that their very existence is the source of all beauty and goodness in the world. If you knew yourself to be the recipient of perfect love from this perfect person, could you freely reject this person? I don't think so. The beauty and love, when we have strong experience of them, seem to have a sort of coercive effect on us. Hopefully those of you who are with a committed partner know what I'm referring to. From that first meeting and beyond, there's this gradual yet steady increase in love for the other person. Now, ideally, you get to the point where your love for the other person culminates in the feeling expressed by young romantics when they say, I just can't not love you. 
Of course, we would all likely agree that what is being expressed is not that one actually lacks the freedom to not love the other, but that one's feelings are so strong it feels as if one cannot love. This is what cannot not love, pardon me. It's what I want to draw attention to, that the feeling of love can be so strong that it can feel as if we have no choice in the matter. We just have to love. So granting this coercive sort of effect that beauty and love can have on us, I think we need to think hard about what effect it would have on us if we were to come face to face with the greatest being imaginable, who on top of their ontological status as such, perfectly loves us. It would seem that by the sum of their attributes and the quality of love they give, this being is irresistible. Furthermore, for those of you who are partial to the conception of God as the greatest being imaginable, it would seem there's a fairly straightforward case to make that God as the greatest being imaginable is inherently irresistible. Specifically, as the greatest being imaginable, he is so compelling, so desirable, that quite literally no one could reject his love. Very, very, very desirable, yet able to be resisted. Surely we could think of a greater being who, given their ontic status, is such that they literally cannot be resisted by anyone. Either way, whether it be an argument in the vein of God being maximally perfect, or the greatest being imaginable and the consequences thereof, or the previous argument that as quality of love received increases, so too does the likelihood of one's reciprocation. I think there's a solid case to be made that, prepare for a little math here, perfect love plus perfect person equals irresistibility. That's where things get interesting. If, as I've suggested, a necessary requirement for a RMRL to obtain is that humans possess the libertarian freedom to reciprocate or reject God's love, then in a situation where God desires a RMRL, the same he's presented with a problem of sorts. Insofar as a RMRL with human persons requires humans possess the libertarian freedom to reciprocate or reject God's love, God, in fully revealing himself as the perfect giver of perfect love, would deprive a person of their libertarian freedom to not love him. As such, if God is interested in this sort of relationship, it would seem he has an overriding reason for at least partially obscuring himself as far as necessary in order to preserve humans' libertary freedom to either reciprocate or reject his love. Now, this claim that a perfect or a complete revelation of God would eliminate our freedom to not love God or to reject him is the basis of at least some universalist discourse surrounding God's love. In fact, Tim Mawson is quite explicit about this point when he says, a perfect revelation of God's existence and will is an offer that no one can freely refuse. On Mawson's view, at the last judgment of God, every person will finally come face to face with God completely, and as a result, According to Mawson, none of us will be free to respond to the offer of an everlasting and perfect communion with him than anything other than wholehearted acceptance. Now, putting aside the question of whether Mawson's universalist conclusion is the right one, Mawson's view adds credence to what I've been arguing thus far. If a full revelation of God eliminates our freedom to not love him, but the libertarian freedom to not love or reject God is necessary for a RMRL to obtain, then if God is interested in this sort of relationship, he will carefully hide himself, at least partially, so as to allow for the libertarian freedom necessary for this relationship to obtain. This would confirm some of the extrapolations I noted above from the results of CSR. Increased religious salience have, has, if not a coercive sort of effect, at minimum heavily influences one's decision making. It's hard to imagine what effect a full revelation of God would have on one's freedom to choose beyond it being very unlikely a person would choose to openly reject God. When combined with the logic of irresistible love, the freedom to choose to not love is not just very unlikely, it is in fact impossible. So that's the main body of the argument. There's a number of objections that I prepared to address, but due to time, we just address two of the more pressing ones. The first is the fact that none of the divine hiddenness arguments that I know of seem to be requiring of God that he fully reveal himself, but more so that he reveal himself more fully than he already has. So there might be a concern among some of you that I've addressed a bit of a straw man here. Needless to say, I don't think I have, and here's the reason why. If my argument is cogent, what I've demonstrated is that divine hiddenness is part and parcel with divine love. Further, following what has been said in regard to the relationship between clarity of revelation and influence exerted on the decision-making process, it is not self-evident that God could reveal himself more clearly than he already purportedly has without such revelation being coercive. 
In other words, if we acknowledge some hiddenness is guaranteed by a perfect God who perfectly loves us, can we be sure that he is capable of providing a more clear divine self-revelation that would not have a coercive sort of effect on us? As I see it, if we can be confident that God has good reason to remain partially hidden, which, as I've argued, we do, and if the evidence from CSR seems to corroborate the claim that further divine self-revelation could in some ways be coercive, which it does, and it seems the burden of proof is on those who think God could reveal himself more clearly without affecting our libertarian freedom in the process. Personally, I'm not sure if such a demonstration is possible. So that's what I anticipate being big objection number one. Big objection number two is related to heaven. Specifically, what exactly are the implications of this argument for heaven? Seemingly, in heaven, God fully reveals himself to us. As I understand it, that's kind of what makes heaven so great. So does that mean, then, that we no longer participate in a RMRL? Not necessarily. In agreement with Aquinas, a person's openness to God's love at the time of their death becomes the enduring condition of that person thereafter. So if you loved God on earth at the time of your death, you will love God for eternity in the afterlife. If that is true, that would cohere with what I have argued, that to stand before the presence of God, one cannot not love God, which would ensure, in agreement with Moss's logic above, that those who do stand before God's presence eternally cannot not love him. Does this mean, though, that the relationship is no longer one of mutually reciprocal love? Well, seeing as these persons who stand before God's presence in heaven use their libertarian freedom on earth to love him, I do not see how God solidifying and honoring that permanent would violate the requirements of AR. If the persons involved use their libertarian freedom to love God, then the requirements of AR and RL have been met. Given that human love is so often fickle, it would seem like the loving thing for God to do would be to ensure that those who love him no longer need to worry about their fickleness in the afterlife. God gives them libertarian freedom to choose to love him and honors that freedom by solidifying them in the afterlife. That means so to conclude, though I have argued that violated expectations are the root of divine hiddenness problems, and that insofar as God is interested in a RMRL with human persons, some amount of divine hiddenness should be expected, I'm not proposing we do away with expectations as much as we recalibrate our expectations accordingly. Seems so evident that if this is the sort of relationship God desires, he will still need to reveal himself, at least partially, and in such a way that persons can know of his existence and his desires for this sort of relationship. So to be clear, the conclusion of this paper is not that one can never come to know God, since God will always remain at least partially hidden. The conclusion is that one can and must come to know God based upon the revelation that is given. But as it relates to our expectations of divine self-revelation and evidence, if some amount of divine hiddenness is expected and God, as omniscient, is the only one in a position to know how much self-revelation he can give without coercing us or overriding our freedom, it would seem, following Paul Moser, we should expect to have to conform our cognitive expectations to God's preferred evidence, which means insofar as our expectations of God do not account for some amount of divine hiddenness and in light of that, are not de derived from purported divine self-revelation, violated expectations will inevitably occur. If that is so, then the problem is not divine hiddenness, but our expectations. I will now happily turn it over for any questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Selector. Um, I, uh, I have a question. So you have a question already? Let's okay. Go. Yeah, I I will. Um, this is Charles Tolliver here. I'm sorry, I haven't gotten my video on, but I have a question um, that can be taken more as a um, favorable comment, but it, it might seem um, specious in some ways. I was wondering whether um, the same reasoning would also work towards explaining why Satan would be hidden. Now, I uh, make this not just out of the blue. I've been rereading C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters, which you may or may not be familiar with. But for those who aren't, Lewis devised a correspondence between an old tempter and a new tempter. Um, this was what got 
C.S. Lewis on the cover of Time magazine, by the way, in the 1940s. He's pictured with a little devil beside him. In any case, um, Screwtape actually proposes to his young devil that it's good to rem the devils should remain slightly hidden. Uh, if they reveal too much of themselves, that they're real beings, um, actually getting your uh, client to hell becomes more, more difficult. So you, you, you don't have to comment on it, but I, 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 when you write this up, when you publish it, I think you're absolutely right. I think this is a terrific paper. So this isn't meant to be an objection, but I, I suggest that there could be a parallel chain of reasoning about why if there was a Satan, um, Satan would perhaps remain hidden as well. Thanks so much for that. That is very insightful. I hadn't thought of that, but I'll uh, certainly pick up my copy of Screw Tape Letters and check that out. I appreciate that. Okay, thanks. Any other question, observation? Follow up. I can raise one more question, um, oh, please. if that's all right. Well, um, Paul Moser uh, famously is not a fan of um, natural theology, and he thinks of it as having all kinds of vices. Uh, this is this has sometimes worried me because um, in your comments at the end, for for if you're a total totally with Moser, it seems as though the um, the yielding to Christ as the morally perfect person has to be almost a, a volitional um, epistemology. That is, it's an act of the will, as opposed to somebody like oh Swinburne or myself. I, I'm an advocate of natural theology as, as leading to revealed theology. And I was wondering whether you think that uh, on your scheme of reciprocal love and the like, does that incline you to more of a Moser position of um, volitional cognitivism, I think he calls it, or would you be closer to C.S. Lewis, say, who believed in that the reality of God is in some ways graspable, um, independent of making that complete yielding to Christ? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I I put Moser's quote in there because I thought uh, it was helpful helpful for making the point. But I actually think um, in kind of more the essay form of this talk, um, I've quoted Paul Moser, and I think he's quite dismissive of the sort of approach I'm taking. Um, I am definitely sympathetic to the natural theology uh, route, similar to kind of what you mentioned as natural theology kind of being a segue into then um, being more open to uh, revealed um, revelation. So um, I definitely think would be more in the Lewis, Swinburne, and even yourself camp um, than Moser, though I absolutely love Moser's work and um, think he has a lot of fantastic points. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Any other question? Or if not, I have a question. Now, I was wondering whether you could, uh, you know, following also the, uh, I don't know whether you've you listened to the talk yesterday of uh, Professor Kelly Clark, so on the various concepts of love and uh, involved. I was wondering which concept of love are we talking about? As you know, as you might know, like there are different concepts and, <laughs> and the traffic jam down here. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, agape, or of course, we're not talking about eros, but which concept of love is involved and whether it is even possible, like the, a mutually uh, reciprocal love, considering God's love and human love, and uh, which concept of love are we talking about here? Because uh, I think that, yeah, it is a more loaded concept in love in when it comes to Greek, for instance. Like uh, we have agape, we have eros, we have philia, and uh, so which concepts of love are we talking about, and what, how is possible considering human limitations and God in limitations? I don't know whether you have thought about this or. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks so much. I unfortunately missed the talk um, yesterday. It was admittedly uh, very much past my bedtime in my time zone. Um, 
Yeah, I actually, uh, I appreciate this. I haven't thought of a lot about what specific uh, conception of love I'm working with. So I think um, instead of just um, shooting uh, from the hip, I should just say, I haven't thought about it a lot. I'd like to think about that. I think I uh, can incorporate that into the essay by uh, clarifying. So thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. You have another question. I think it's up because any, say, investigation about God's love, and maybe we should clarify more which concept of love is at issue. There is a great encyclical from uh, Pope Benedict, Deus Caritas Est, maybe. I don't know. That yeah. Maybe it would be interesting and relevant okay. because it's a philosophical and theological discussion about the various concepts of love. You know, Eros, Philia, Agape, I think it would be relevant for your project. And uh, there is another question or observation here. Uh, thanks later, nice investigation. Understood right or not, do you correlate the free will and the obligation to love God? Uh, you can see it in the chat. You can read it in the chat. So is there a correlation between free will and the obligation in a way to love God? He's asking Samara. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, uh, admittedly. Samara, can you help us out here, please? So sorry to put you on the spot, Samara. Acho que ele não entendeu, não entendeu a pergunta. Thank you. Uh, you heard me. Because I don't know, you talk about free will, and, and I don't know if I understood uh, everything, you know. <laughs> and my question is about uh, if I understood right or not. The point is if you correlate free will with, um, I don't know, uh, obligation, of, I don't know if the word is obligation, uh, to love God, you know. You talk about this, right? Um, totally <laughs> wrong. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank. Thank you. Um, yeah. I within the presentation, I have not correlated the two. Um, I think we should love God. I think we have free will too. Um, whether that obligates us to, I'm not sure. I think would be the easiest way to answer that. Uh, and I'm looking at the other question in the comments right now. Thanks again, Slater. If there are no, no more questions, I think we can uh, start a coffee break. So today is going to be a longer coffee break. We'll have 15 minutes more for more coffees. And uh, we'll come back at uh, 4.30 with the uh, next keynote speaker, which is Professor Charity Anderson from Bay University. So I'll see you at uh, half past four. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for... so much. Appreciate your time. So let's see you in 45 minutes. OK, thank you and uh, see you soon. Bye bye. Allora, vamos da aquí a 45 minutos. Vamos voltar uh, para a presentação da professora uh, Charity Anderson. OK? Obrigado, pessoal.